Hello, my name is Tony. Ever watch a film and tick off the talents involved in the making of it and then just wonder what the fuck went wrong? I have, too many times. The Holcroft Covenant, to a large extent, is one such film. It's difficult to focus on or identify what exactly happened here. It's unlikely to be just one thing, but rather a combination of elements that conspired to orchestrate its failure to achieve whatever it was trying to achieve. And if you're wondering what it was trying to achieve, I'm afraid I don't know for certain. All I can do is surmise. I imagine it aspired to being a powerful, high-concept conspiracy thriller that both thrilled and entertained audiences and made money. And if my imaginings are correct, it failed on all those counts. If, however, the objective was to make a low-rent, cloak-and-dagger muddle of a film that teetered on the brink of unintentional parody, aborted engagement with audiences and lost money, then in that case, it was a rip-snorting success story, motherfucker. Taking a gander at the underlying foundation, you could be forgiven for expecting a relatively positive outcome. The Holcroft Covenant is based on the best-selling novel by Robert Ludlum. Ludlum wrote Globe in transatlantic action thriller novels of doorstop proportions. They were very popular, and he had a vast readership and fan base. But this didn't translate into movie success until The Born Identity in 2002, in which Matt Damon played Ludlum's amnesiac assassin on the run. Prior to this, there had been several US TV miniseries adaptations. The Rhineman Exchange in 1977, The Born Identity in 1988, and The Apocalypse Watch in 1997. Before the Holcroft Covenant, The Osterman Weekend was the only other attempt to make a movie out of one of Ludlum's blockbusters. It was director Sam Peckinpah's last feature film. It was way better than Convoy, but to be honest, that isn't much of a recommendation, as a night spent face planting a lit barbecue is better than Convoy. Whether or not you like Ludlum's work, most would have to admit that he knew how to fashion a labyrinthine and intriguing plotline that sat just the right side of feasible. The basis of the Holcroft Covenant is solid enough. Three Nazi generals in the last gasp days of the Second World War have seen the end coming for some time. They've been diverting colossal sums of money into the Swiss banking system, embezzling from the Third Reich. Their plan, so it seems, is that 40 years after the war, their surviving children will be expected to sign a covenant, giving them control of funds with which to make reparation and finance good deeds in recompense for the horrors and crimes the Nazi regime has committed against the world and humanity. Clausen, the leader of the trio, shoots the other two through the head, and then turns his luger on himself. Sweet of him? Me? I'd have shot them all right, then fucked off with the loot. Hey look, don't judge. Spoils of war, you dig? Anyhow, Clausen's wife ran out on him early on, taking their son to America. When the Nazi shot started to get a little more serious than just a few politically charged rounds of lager shandy in the beer keller and a tango with Sally Bowles at the Kit Kat Club. He's now a grown-up New York architect called Noel Holcroft, and he's just been made aware of the covenant and the terms therein. He must find the kids of the other two Nazis so they can all sign it and activate the release of over four billion dollars into their control to make the world a better place. Me? I'd sign the thing all right, then shoot the other two in the head and fuck off with the loot. Hey, again, don't judge spoils of peacetime, all right? That's the launch pad for the narrative, and all things being equal, even though they're not, which I'm sure you know, it's a serviceable enough premise. We've all come across worse, yeah? Much worse. So this 500 plus page novel requires adaptation for the screen. Who are you gonna get? People who should know what they're doing, right? How about George Axelrod, who scripted The Seven Year Rich, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and the original The Manchurian Candidate, one of the best, most innovative and daring screen thrillers ever produced, a modern classic. Add some collaboration by Edward Arnhalt, who did the screenplay for Richard Fleischer's groundbreaking The Boston Strangler, and John Hopkins, who co-scripted the Bond movie Thunderball, and whose play, This Story of Yours, was made into the electrifying Sean Connery flick The Offence, which he also adapted for the screen. Talented people of a certain creative calibre, gotta be worth something. When it comes to versatile thriller directors who could turn their hand to hard-hitting action and mind-bendingly suspenseful drama, the track record of John Frankenheimer speaks for itself. The Birdman of Alcatraz, The Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, The Train, Seconds, Grand Prix, The Gypsy Moths, The French Connection 2, and Black Sunday, and more. He's prolific, relentless, he has impeccable style and form where this sort of stuff is concerned. He is one of the greats. Then how about Jerry Fisher to handle 
juggle the visuals. He lends the go-between the offence juggernaut an aces high. Solid as they come, great eye. Music? We'll get that Stanislaw guy. Who? Stanislaw Siowix. Fuck's he? You know, wrote the score for Biggles. Biggles? Yeah, Biggles Adventures in Time. You know... I have no idea what you're talking about, but if you raid him, let's get him. Want a superstar leading man? Someone with an edge, a sophisticated sort of American bruiser, with a hint of vulnerability and a commanding screen presence? How about James Kahn? Yes, absolutely perfect. Supporting cast. Some eye candy for the love interest, but someone who's a bit atypical. Not run-of-the-mill Hollywood glamorous, but fetchingly cute, with a touch of emotional depth and complexity, and that groovy English rose sort of sexuality. That girl who was in The Winds of War. Who? Ali McGraw? No, not her. Lisa Eilbacker? Nope, neither of those are English rose types. Victoria Tennant? Yep, her. She's just peachy. Then we'll get the guy who was in Bright's Head Revisited to play her brother. Not Jeremy Irons, the other one, Archie Anderson. Andrews. Anthony Andrews. Whatever. Get him. And rope in some top flight character actors with a bit of dramatic pedigree up in them. Say Bernard Hepton, Michael Lonsdale, fucking great in Moonraker. And what about Lily Palmer to play James Kahn's mother? A veteran actress with a real touch of class. And she's German. Rope him in. This is gonna be great. Yep, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Well, what should have been just wasn't. Very early on, the recently late but eternally great James Kahn simply walked off set one day and never came back. The lead was gone. Why exactly? Don't know. But something lit a fire under him, and he fucked right off into the sunset. Michael Caine ended up as a last-minute replacement for the part of Noel Holcroft, an American architect with a Cockney accent. Now, although accents were not Caine's strong suit, that never stopped him taking a punt, but here he seems to feel it wasn't worth even making the effort to add a passing nod to some vocals befitting a man who was brought up his whole life in the States. How he got this gig in the midnight hour is up for debate. Probably available at the time, money a factor, some nice European locations, Caine liked a nice location, or maybe someone a favour. However it came to be, he took the lead and will be, for all time, the screen Noel Holcroft. This is how it went. Noel is on a construction site when he gets a phone call. Before you can say Lord fuck a duck, he's meeting with Manfredi, Michael Lonsdale, on a riverboat in Geneva. Manfredi is a Swiss banker entrusted with a dispersal of $4 billion to the offspring of the Nazi suicide jockeys. This gives Kane the opportunity for a 30-second rant about his biological father. He's in Michael's shouty place again. However, the thought of being in control of a colossal shitload of cash soon calms him down. On leaving the boat, two men get shot dead by another man who might have been gunning for Holcroft but killed two wrong birds instead of one right one who was clearly in his line of sight. I don't envisage a long career for a hitman this inept. Best explore other career avenues, you cockeyed clown. Noel visits his mother Althene, Lily Palmer, the owner of a New York bookshop. Althene doesn't buy the altruistic motivations of Clausen and the others. She points out that she was married to Clausen and knew him intimately as a fanatical and committed Nazi scumbag. Wonder what first attracted her to him? Uh, eyes maybe? Big dick? Anyway, despite Despite his mother's counsel, Noel decides to pursue the matter, even when some random called Briggs is found garroted to death in the lobby of his apartment building, and he later finds a message from a random called Briggs on his answer phone. Strange coincidence? Anyway, never mind, moving on. Next, Noel is in Trafalgar Square meeting with Leighton, Bernard Hepton, who he just assumes works for MI5. The hitman is also there, so Noel approaches him first, thinking he's Leighton. This is confusing, as Noel had a clear look at the guy after he knocked off the two wrong birds in Geneva, so why would he think the guy he thought was trying to kill him is the guy who's been sent to help him? Let it go. This sort of shit happens a lot. You won't find any sense in it. Leighton takes him to a church to meet with Heldon, Victoria Tennant, who is the daughter of Von Tebold, another of the Nazi trio. Heldon has seen carry on spying, and it's left a lasting impression. She sits in an empty church wearing a wig, headscarf, and sunglasses. Noel sits in the pew directly in front of her. They communicate in whispers, and Heldon keeps tersely ordering Noel not to turn around and give the game away. It must not become known they're in a church and are talking to each other. Who will witness this for fuck's sake? Leighton and Heldon take Noel to the country residence of the Oberst, Richard Monk. The Oberst is running an anti-neo-Nazi network and working with Leighton and Heldon. He's an old guy in a wheelchair with a gun. He threatens to shoot Noel if he doesn't swear that he has no intention of signing the covenant and using the money to fund the formation of the Fourth Reich. Noel swears he won't be doing this, and I would do exactly the same if held at gunpoint and on pain of death. But it seems a 
good enough assurance for everyone, so that's all right then. Next, Heldon takes Noel to meet her brother Johan Anthony Andrews at an exclusive inner city horse riding academy bar and grill. Does such a thing exist? Can I be asked to check? No, I fucking can't. Johan is the second signatory and he sports a very untrustworthy looking moustache which just screams shady fucker right up in your face. The hitman is sat in the bar. How or why he came to be there, I can't begin to imagine, but he is. Johan advises Noel and Heldon to slip out the back exit and go to Berlin and connect with the final signatory Kessler, Mario Adorf. They must travel separately. So they're in Berlin, in the red light district, and Heldon is disguised as a black PVC clad prostitute with peroxide hair. Noel recognises her immediately, good fucking disguise. They check into a seedy hotel. Visiting Kessler, they discover he is in fact a famous conductor, not of buses or lightning, but of orchestras. He's also an over-effusive, fat, sweaty lardo. When they leave, Kessler drops the jovial slob act, and the hitman appears to be given his new orders. Aha! Back in New York, someone tries to murder Noel's mother. It's another botched hit by another useless hitman who only succeeds in crashing his car through Althine's shop front whilst a stylish looking black woman blows up said car with a clutch bag that's really a bomb. In Berlin, Noel and Heldon are growing closer, if you get my drift, and on leaving their slum hotel, find themselves in the middle of a sleazy, glitter-drenched carnival celebrating prostitution. Well, there's a lot about it to celebrate in some respect. Lots of bare tits and ass on show. An androgynous German guy introducing himself briefly as Fritzel punches Noel in the gut. The hitman materialises, seemingly up out of the ground, and grabs Heldon, dragging her away. It's a kidnap. Noel and one of Leighton's men, who also just pops up out of nowhere, give chase. As Heldon is bundled into a car and the hitman drives away at speed, Noel, who has been given a gun by Heldon, which didn't work but now does, I'm not going to go into it, is suddenly reborn as a crack shot and blasts a bullet through the windscreen and into the hitman's face. Heldon is saved. Yay! Johan, who was also in in Berlin meets up with Noel and Heldon at the Brandenburg Gate. He tells them to head to Geneva by road, and he and Kessler will meet them there for the signing of the Covenant in a few days. This gives Johann time to nip over to the UK and pay a visit to the Oberst. There he finds Althine, also paying a visit, as it was one of the Oberst men who saved her life in New York. They are old friends and colleagues in the fight against Nazism. Johann reveals his true intentions regarding the Covenant, the dream of a new Fourth Reich, and the elimination of Holcroft once he has signed. He shoots the Oberst dead. Chances are, Althine ain't gonna fare much better. Leighton and his men intercept Noel and Heldon. He takes Noel back to Britain to meet with the Oberst. They find his bodyguard dead and the Oberst and Althine likewise relieved of the burden of breathing. Noel is grief-stricken, but grief turns to rage when they snatch a look at the CCTV footage, which shows Johan arriving and killing the bodyguard. The question of whose side Heldon is on is soon clarified. We are shown her meeting with Johan in a hotel room in Geneva, and we see them getting down and dirty. Yes, it's depraved and disgusting. Proof positive they're keeping incest firmly in the family. In the bank boardroom with Manfredi presiding, Holcroft, Johan and Kessler sign the covenant. But as they are leaving, they find that Noel has called a surprise press conference. He reveals all to the world. No, not like that. I mean, about the four billion and the plan for a fourth Reich. Johan is livid, pulls a gun, when Kessler is shot. In fury and anger, Noel forces the gun to face Johan, and he is blasted out of this world. Well, that's the covenant sign those two shot, and if it was me, I'd be fucking off with the dough. Don't judge, spoils of being the last Nazi orphan standing. Only it isn't me, is it? It's Michael Caine, so that doesn't happen. The final scenes pose the question, does Noel know what Heldon was really up to? Her true alliance and incestuous predilections. When they're alone in a hotel room later that night, with only a TV, a loaded gun, and each other for company, we'll get to find out. All that talent involved and still the Holcroft Covenant didn't work. James Kahn bailed for a reason, or maybe a few of them, and I can sort of see why. It's scrambled, implausible, incoherent, and with certain manifestations of near parody where you're unsure if you're supposed to laugh or accept it as what someone thinks really resembles spycraft or evasion tactics in the field. It's hard to believe that the three people who are credited with the script are the three people who wrote it. Characters just appear and involve themselves in situations with no credible explanation of how they came to be there. Some of the dialogue is fine, but a lot of it is just vapid and mindless tripe. Most of the best lines go to Bernard Hepton's shadowy Leighton. One is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy and could have been a mantra extolling the philosophy of the entire film. He advises Michael Caine's character, 
Do not attempt anything too vividly cinematic. That about sums it up, that does. Like someone doing the writing had some insight and worked that line in. My money's on Axelrod. But it's still watchable and does have moments that can be enjoyed. And, well, praised, albeit faintly. Some of Kane's quips and observations are pithy and mildly amusing. Frankenheimer conveys an edgy sense of paranoia and danger at times with clever use of close-ups and canted camera angles, especially effective in the Berlin night scene and the chase and shootout during the hooker carnival. There is some arty expressionistic lighting at play in the slum hotel scenes which provide a hint of a third man aesthetic. Very slight hint though, I must stress that. Kane is pretty much by the numbers. When I first saw the film, I thought he looked pallid and unwell, like he had food poisoning after eating a dodgy bratwurst sandwich or something. After seeing it again on Blu-ray, he looks a lot healthier. Either remastering and upscaling makes you look less peaky, or I have different glasses these days. Who's to say? One thing I am sure about is his capacity to express emotion, especially psychological torment and grief. He is one of those rare actors who can genuinely cry to all Order and make you feel it. And he does it at least twice here. Victoria Tennant is cute, lovely, pretty, sexy, but she's given a lot of dumb outfits to wear and dumb lines to say, and says them like she's been coached by Julie Andrews in full saccharine overload mode. It is a bit of a shock when she starts groping, grasping and grunting with her on-screen brother, so it effectively reinforces the depths of depravity we normally and stereotypically associate with Nazis. Fair enough, I'd say. Not like they deserve anything much better. As for Sebastian flight, I mean Anthony Andrews, he has the best dramatic scene in the film. When he inflicts a lengthy speech on the Oberst and Althine before killing them, he devilishly channels his inner Lord Haw-Haw. It's a chilling recitation of his plans for establishing a Fourth Reich and his twisted reasons for doing so. The evil gleam in his eye in conjunction with his clipped and refined cut glass diction embody the cold ring of right-wing fanaticism upper-class young conservatives used to be so adept and unselfconscious at expressing. It's well-written, well performed and breathe some frosty breath on the marrow. Bernard Hepton and Michael Lonsdale are great character actors who deliver no matter what they're in. Fisher's cinematography isn't his best work but it's fluid and functional and Stanislas' score with its military motifs and Europop synth lines sort of fits the bill. It's not enough, though. For Kane, it's another runer come burner. He coasted through, then moved on. He would do better, and he would do worse. But when the day comes, and memorial tributes are made to, for, and about him, I doubt the Holcroft Covenant will get a mention. John Frankenheimer was a genius director, no doubt, and he redeemed himself by making 52 pick up with Roy Scheider next, a cracking neo-noir thriller based on an Elmore Leonard novel, which I love, both film and book, but no one else seems to. His final masterpiece, the supercharged thriller Ronin was yet to come. Just don't mention the island of Dr. Moreau. Not ever. Final words? I don't see myself ever watching The Holcroft Covenant again. Another Blu-ray disc that will gather dust until one day, when I am gone, someone somewhere will pick it up, slap it in the drive, watch it and say, what the fuck did he buy this for? And of course, there will be no satisfactory answer forthcoming. Thanks as always for your time and attention. It means a lot that you give it freely, which is fortuitous as I can't afford to pay you. If you like, like. If not, not. If you want, subscribe. And I'll be happy to welcome you aboard the Demeter. Sorry, the channel. Time. Yes, time. Time, I looked at something good for the next one. But what could it be? Wait and see, pilgrims, he says, like there's a choice.